Hello, and welcome to this enhanced podcast from Enlightening Science, the outreach wing of the Newton Project at Sussex University. We're dedicated to providing resources to help improve the understanding of Isaac Newton, his importance to both his own time and ours, his influence and his thought. I'm with Jim Bennett, Director of the Oxford Museum of the History of Science. Jim is an expert on scientific instruments from the 16th through to the 18th centuries, and today he's going to be speaking on the instrument makers of the 18th century and their influence on scientific practice. The person who makes the first instruments, measuring instruments at Greenwich is Thomas Tompion, who is famous as a, as a, as a clock and watch maker. And his partner in, in mechanical horology, a man called George Graham, is even more successful than Tompion at making astronomical instruments. And Graham, in the early 18th century, establishes a whole kind of suite of instruments which are, the foundation, which are, which are first of all, um, built at, at Greenwich. And then they're copied by a succession of makers in the 18th century. A man called John Bird, for instance, uh, makes mural quadrants copied from the Graham, initial Graham quadrant at, uh, at Greenwich. Um, so, so there are a, 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 a sequence of these makers. You would think of a man like uh, Jonathan and Jeremiah Sisson, for instance, and then uh, Jesse Ramsden and Edward Triton. These are names that sort of trot off the, uh, the tongue of someone who's interested in instruments in the 18th century as the most revered and, um, and sought after instrument makers in, in uh, 18th century London. And I really do mean sought after. I mean, they have an international clientele. Um, they're enormously respected. They're often uh, made fellows of the Royal Society. They publish at the, 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 the top flight. They publish uh, papers in the Philosophical Transactions. They're, ev they're even awarded things like the Copley Medal, the, 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 the top award from the uh, society. And yet they're mechanics, yet they're people who work in trade. So there's this very interesting possibility in, in London, which does not exist in Paris, for instance, that is unimaginable in Paris, uh, where the uh, makers can become respected and revered even members of the, um, of the scientific, of the mathematical community. Um, it almost becomes, in fact, I wouldn't even say almost, it becomes a problem by the end of the 18th century. Because someone like Jesse Ramsden and, Ed, and Edward Triton, um, you really had to go to Ramsden if you wanted the best instrument. But because Ramsden had so much trade, he didn't have to take your custom. And if you, wanted to, if you went to Ramsden, um, J.D. Cassini comes over from Paris, for instance, to buy a mural quadrant from Ramsden, and he never gets one. And you might think, here's a man bringing a, a friend, as he thought, bringing a government commission from France. He's got good money. He can pay the price, you know. But if the, if the commission doesn't interest Ramsden, Ramsden's not switched on by it. He has more interesting ideas of his own. And, uh, and he, doesn't have to, he doesn't have to bother. So it's a very curious uh, situation. Ramsden's making plenty of money uh, through his uh, wor workshop making day-to-day -day instruments or having his workmen. He, he has some, something like 40 workmen in his workshop um, making day-to-day making -day instruments. And these big commissions from the observatories, he wants to take on his own designs because he sees himself as an, as an, as an original artist uh, in, in the 18th century terms. So, what were, so just moving on with that then, what, were, what was Ramsden's own idea? Well, he thought that quadrants were finished. After all, we'd had the Graham Quadrant I mentioned at the start of the 18th century. By now, Ramsden thinks the, the quadrant is going to be replaced by the circle. So you'll have a complete circle rather, which, which, which rotates around a horizontal axis instead of having a fixed quadrant with a, with a, uh, with a moving uh, telescopic side. And Ramsden has very good reasons for wanting to move onto circles, and which are very sound, I mean, mechanically, in, in terms of how the instrument functions, in terms of how you can correct the, uh, the errors by, by, by taking readings from different parts of the circle and also, so on. There's all sorts of advantages. So Ramsden is right. Ramsden is often right, by the way, so that, that's not surprising. But he was dead right. But it meant that if, if, if you come along with, as, a, as a, a, a commissioning astronomer with an idea, with a design of your own, Ramsden will change it for you. 
And if you don't like the changes he's made, well, you just have to go elsewhere. He'll, he'll sort of say, he'll say, and he was notorious for this, oh, well, I will, I'll make that, okay, I'll do what you say, but he never did. He didn't have to, and lots of people were frustrated and, uh, and ended up not getting their instruments from people like Rams. And then Triton was the same kind of problem. So it, it, it's, it's very special, and for a while it's very productive that, that these heroic makers have this extraordinary status. By the way, I'm talking just about the, the mathematical, astronomical makers. The others, the ones who are making more everyday natural philosophical instruments, do not quite achieve, don't become fellows of the Royal Society. I mean, even George Adams, who is the instrument maker to the king, doesn't become a fellow of the Royal Society. That state is reserved, it seems, for these mathematical instrument makers who are making astro astronomical measuring instruments. But but once you've achieved that status, then you have an, an extraordinarily powerful influence over what instruments get made and what instruments don't. This enhanced podcast has been an enlightening science production from the University of Sussex. The sound recordist was Lucy Cook. It was edited by Lucy Cook and Pete Langman. The producer was Pete Langman. Mm -hmm.